welcome to Progressive Art. In this drawing um, video we're going to be just learning about the different areas of shadow, so light and dark on objects, and we're going to be using the example of a sphere or a ball. So I'm just using a little cup I have here to draw myself um, a perfect circle. I'm using an HB pencil. I'm going very softly. I don't actually want the marks to show really dark. I want them to blend. So very simple drawing. I'll try to zoom in a little bit to see maybe it will help. Can't zo zoom too much or it won't focus. So there we go. Well, let's try that. So you can just barely see that there is a circle there. In about um, a halfway point or maybe a little bit less, I'm just going to draw a line that comes to one side. I'm going to skip over the circle and draw the line coming out the other side as if it's sitting on a table. Okay, so very simple. If you want to use a ruler, you can. Um, it's up to you. So in order to have uh, shadows, light and dark areas, you need a light source. So we're going we're gonna to make our light source up here as if we have a lamp or the sun or something shining down. So I actually draw myself a little light source for this, for this drawing. And this reminds me that the light is going to come down and hit my object, okay? And it shows me all the areas that the light would hit. Depending on how big my light source is, uh, light source is the the rays will go out. So think of it when you were when you were little and you were first drawing a sun and you might draw the sun in a nice big sun in the corner and have these rays coming out. Try to picture it that way in your mind as if the rays are coming down. You need a surface. So the surface here is uh, we're going to pretend it's a table, but it could be absolutely anything. Okay, so anything that an object would be sitting on. So now um, as the light comes down. We're going we're gonna to do like a little arrow just to show you. You don't have to do that. So the light comes down as if it's going to hit the object. And the area that's closest to the object, the highest part, we'll say, of the object, we call that the highlight. Okay? And so that would be the lightest and brightest area. And so I'm, uh, I'm sure you've all seen an apple sitting, a uh, nice shiny apple. And the reflective quality of the apple allows the light to bounce onto it. And you're going to see this highlight that almost is like a white dot or a white spot. And they can be all sorts of shapes. They can be all sorts of, you might even have multiple ones depending on what's reflecting on it. And, but it's usually the, it is the lightest part of your object. Okay? Now, the opposite of that would be the area that's the furthest away from your light source. And so that would be where your shadow would occur. So it would be on the other side of the object, opposite the light source. So if my light source is on this side, my shadow won't be here. It will be over here, opposite side. Okay? And we're talking right now just the shadows that are on the object itself. So you've got the highlight, which is the brightest. You've got the shadow, which is the darkest. So what about the in-between? Well, from the highlight to the shadow, or the shadow to the highlight, we have this middle area, and we call that our mid-tone. Okay, mid-tone. So then you have brightest white, start goes from light, light gray to a darker gray, darker gray, until you get very dark where your shadows are. So then on the object itself, when the, uh, the rays of light come down and are hitting our object, they are also coming down and hitting our table and then reflecting back up onto our object. So if our table was bright red and our object was white, we would actually have a glow of the red onto our object. So it's a very important thing to think about when you're adding color. But it also applies to light. So our light has come down in rays hits our object and it reflects back up onto the object. We call that reflected light. And this is probably the trickiest one for when you're first starting out in, in doing drawings that are 3D. You really have to look at your sphere. You have to look at the object you're drawing because that light could end up being uh, a very unusual shape depending on what it has hit. Okay, so what you're looking for is a bit of a glow, and I usually find that glow, if this is my darkest shadow here, my reflected light is like a sliver of lighter gray right beside that darkness before I get to my surface, okay? And then we call that reflected light, and that's the colors that are, I'm sorry, the shadows that are on the actual um, object that you're drawing. Some people call the darkest of the shadow the core shadow. You can use that expression if you like. Now any object that's put in front of a light source is going to cast or drop a shadow onto the surface that it's on. 
and we call this the cast shadow. And it usually mimics um, somewhat the shape. Um, so I have a circular shape here. I won't actually have a circular um, cast shadow, but it'd almost be elongated, like a little bit of an oval, okay? something like that. I'm not going to draw it in with a hard edge. I don't want it to have a, a hard contour line, but just so that you know, it's, it would be in the area opposite the light source. And it's the shadow that's on the surface, not on the object. So let's put them in and see if we can explain how this all works. I'm switching from my HB pencil now to a softer pencil. I can use a 4B, a 2B. I'm going to use a 4B right now. And I know that this area is dark, and I know my sh uh, my cast shadow is dark. And if I'm nervous about um, putting in color on a drawing, then I'm going to go to the areas that are the darkest. Because if I make an error, that's the area that can be hidden. I'm not going to go up here to the super light area. If I do that and I make a mistake, it's really hard to fix it. Now my object, uh, what I like to do is meld my contour line, which is my outline, into the shading that I do. So I actually at the end don't want to see it as an outline, okay? And I use a circular, slightly oval motion, very tiny little ovals, mini, mini ovals, and I call that continuous tone, where it continually does a nice even tone. And I completely relax my hand. So you know the difference. When you are pressing really, really hard, I'm going to show you two, two versions of it right here. So if I take my 4B pencil and I press really hard, really super hard back and forth, I get this burnished, solid, solid, dark charcoal gray. Okay, And if I go over top of that charcoal gray again, pressing hard, but only go halfway, do you see a tone difference? Not really. Okay, so it's like you've used up all the potential of that pencil. And then what happens when the light hits it, there's this awful shine. And you can even see that reflected as I'm moving the, the page. And that really is distracting when you're doing a pencil drawing. So try to avoid that heavy, heavy pressure. Especially when you have a dark area in your drawing, you want to avoid this because it's tempting to just get in there and um, press really hard and be done with it. But don't do that if you really want a, a picture that you can see all the way through. Why don't you do that? Well, let's try the other way of doing it, okay? This time I'm going to completely relax my hand. There's no tension in my arm at all. I'm going to hold my fingers back a little bit further. If you find that you're pressing hard, move your fingers back a little bit further. I'm going to use that same motion, that slightly circular motion. Look how much softer it is. It's still a 4B, so it's going to have a certain amount of darkness. If I want lighter, I can go to a 2B or an HB. So there you go, quite a bit darker. What happens when I go over in the exact same light hand, no pressure, but I only go halfway on this? Can you notice a tone difference? You can. And if I went halfway on this one, can you notice three tone differences? Yes, you can. So as many layers as I put on there, it's another tone. So just by, by using that super, super soft, relaxed hand, no pressure, you should feel, you should not have to relax your muscle when you're done. That's what we're after. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. I'll hold it up a little bit so you can see. You can see the glare off the other one, but no glare off the layers I did. Okay, so that's pretty important. The other thing that I wanted to show you was I mentioned continuous tone. So we're doing a, a circular object here. I work in the shape of the object. So I'm doing these oval shapes and I'm kind of, and they, what they end up doing is overlapping each other. And because I'm doing this super soft uh, way of, of filling it in, you're not going to get um, dark and light areas. You get this continuous tone. Well, let me show you the difference. So. When we were little, we took our pencil crayons out and we would do this, and we would start to fill in an area, and we'd go horizontally or vertically, okay, back and forth. So then we had to continue. Let's say we had a larger area, and we do this, and we do the next part, right? And then we do the next part as we filled in our area. But what happened? What happened here? And what happened here? So because we went over it and layered it, just like we layered up here, it shows a seam, okay? One area will always be darker, and your whole picture would have these seams all the way through it. It doesn't look natural on, let's say, a portrait or on someone's face or a flower. So we wanted to avoid this, and the way to avoid it is to use that slightly circular motion, because you can even do weird shapes maintaining 
that slightly circular motion and it's nice and even. Okay, and I call that continuous tone. Okay, so we're going to apply that here. I'm going to start in the shadow area. I'm going to work this way. I'm not going to worry about my reflected light. I'm just going to start adding kind of at the contour down here. Relaxed hand. I'm not worried about it getting dark. When I work a larger area, I, you'll notice that my ovals might be a little bit larger. And then when I work towards my end, you'll notice that I start to change my direction. I, I go from the line into my object, not out, and that keeps my edges neat, okay? What you don't want to see are circles. Okay, if you're if you're creating actual ovals and you can see the con them as a line, you don't want that. You want rough. Back off your fingers, so go further back and loosen up. Um, I also to use a piece of sandpaper to dull down the ends of my pencil, so that I'm not working on a tip. I still like a sharp pencil. I just don't want to work on a tip. Okay, and as now I've getting, I'm getting to the closer to the top of my sphere, I like to just stop. I know that some people will continue with layers and layers of the pencil. I like to use tertillions um, or stomps, um, and I'll show you what I like to use, and I keep quite a number of them. Well, here's one here actually I can use. Okay, so this is just twisted up paper, and to a point I use the side of it, and it, they get really dirty and they're wonderful. So I'm going to use that same circular motion. But again, I'm going to go back to where I started and in that same circular motion, I'm going to kind of just gently rub. Now obviously you're forcing the graphite into the paper fibers, so um, it's going to be more difficult to erase. So make sure you do this when you're completely happy with everything. You don't do this um, when you see errors because it'll be more difficult to clean it up. So just because I'm rubbing it in a circular motion, and you can use your finger to do this, you can use a chamois to do this, even a Q-tip um, will do this. And the circular motion helps to blend it all together, fill in any of the little white areas. And it, what it also does is it picks up the graphite on your tertillion, on your paper, your paper stump. And then when you get to this area where you didn't put any shading at all, now watch what happens. It's going to start cleaning itself off as I work up this area, getting lighter and lighter as it deposits the graphite onto the paper. So I can go back, kind of even the tone, make sure they're melding together. But again, as I'm getting closer to the highlight, the area closest to the light, it's now lighter and lighter and lighter. Okay. Until you've got your lightest, lightest gray at the top and it gradually works its way down. Now I won't say that there's a big difference from here to here. So what I do then is I go back to my pencil, the same 4B pencil, in the exact same place I'm going to start. And I'm going to do another layer of that continuous tone, super light hand, one more layer, but this time I'm not going to go all the way. I'm going to follow the, sh the curving of this sphere. And I'm not going to go all the way to the top. I'm only going to go this time halfway to where I went last time. So I'm depositing more graphite. I've deposited a second layer. So I've created a second tone. I'm going to take my tertillion again, again being careful on my edges, because that's where you can lose your shape the most. Go in a circular motion. And fill in that area. But then I leave that area, uh, the top area alone. I don't need to darken it. It's exactly the tone that I want it to be. So I don't now, just because I've gone and done another layer, I don't have to do the whole layer everywhere. I only put the layer where it's needed. Now I'm going to go back and do a third. 
starting again on the shadow area and only putting the layer on the shadow area and you can continue doing layer upon layer until you get it to look as realistic as you like. Okay, so you're starting to see um, the sphere obviously is going from light to dark. It's a lot more obvious now. So now I've got this nice dirty tertillion and I'm going to use it in a circular motion. I'm going to go right off the bottom here of my sphere in a, in a nice wide circular motion. And it's mimicking the shape of the object, okay? And I'm going to go out quite a bit and I haven't drawn a contour. I'm just pulling the color out to give it some shadow, okay? And I've created a cast shadow. Now the wonderful thing is, once you've done your first layer, you're going to go back in, and this time you're only going to go halfway. So you're only going to do your next layer with big ovals, but you're not going to go right to the end. You're only going to go halfway, okay? Once you finish that, you're going to do it again. And you see how when my tortillion touches the sphere, it picks up the graphite and it pulls it. And now you're only going to go half of this distance. So you're only going a third of the way. Alright, so then you get this gradual dark to light of a very natural cast shadow. Now, I know some of you are saying, hey, you forgot all about the reflected light, but I did not. Once I have bl blended all this, then according to the sphere that I'm drawing, now, I say that because if you're sitting over here, it's going to look different than someone who's sitting over here or where I'm sitting in front. So where I'm sitting, I see a slight um, reflected area right here. And it's like a, a light gray. It's not as bright as the highlight. So compare your tones, and it should be darker than the highlight. But there is this sliver, and it divides, or it separates, sorry, the shadow from the cast shadow, okay? So it should be around there somewhere. And what it does is because this is lighter, it automatically makes this area here look darker. And so when we go in with our um, pencil, we can darken the seam right where it touches, that little sliver where it touches the table. That little bit of darkness really, really um, makes it work. And I always go over with my, I always soften every time with my stomp. Okay? And I'm not doing the whole contour, I'm only doing just this little tiny area where it actually touches. I'm using a kneadable eraser, okay, which um, can be pulled apart like silly putty, and then when it gets dirty, you just mush it up and soften it. I use Stadler or I use um, Prismacolor I like very much. Um, there's lots of companies out there that uh, have some really nice erasers, so I make it into a, a, a point, somewhat of a point, and then I gently tap it and it pulls away some of the color. Now I use this instead of a white eraser because this prevents um, shavings of erasers. This just picks up the graphite without leaving anything behind. Okay, And the advantage of that is then I'm not smearing as I dust away um, the eraser shavings, I'm, I'm not worried that I might be smearing something. Okay, Excellent for chalk pastel and charcoal as well. Okay, so we should be now getting a, a clearer view of our object, where the shadows go. Now, personally, I would go back in and I would darken that shadow just a touch. I don't think it's quite as dark as it should be. This time in a circular motion, watching that I don't go over my reflected light, following the curve of the object, and this time I'm not going to go up there. I'm almost going to make it like a bit of a, uh, a scoop or a, a sideways C. Okay. Go back to my tertillion, circular motion, mimicking the shape, following the shape, intensifying it just that little bit. Over here I want to just blend it a little bit more. There we go. And I can't stress enough that you'd actually want to have this object in front of you to really see where all the real dark areas and light areas are. There's nothing beats working from life where it's right in front of you, okay? Don't just do it from your imagination. Okay, so a quick review now of the different areas. Oh, before I do that, sorry, another little trick. I'll take my kneadable eraser, and you see how there's that tiny, flimsy um, high, uh, little uh, outline there? I just 
remove it in my highlight area. And the rest of my edges, I just want to make sure that they are definitely blended in to where my mid-tone is, okay? So there's no contour line showing anymore because objects don't have actual contour lines. We draw them, we need them, but they don't actually contain them. So we want to get rid of it when we're done. All right, so let's review our different shadow areas. First of all, we have a light source and we have a surface that that's going to um, hold our object. We have um, a highlight, which is the closest to the light source. From the highlight down, we have this middle area we call the mid-tone. The mid-tone hits the shadow. The darkest part of the shadow is called the core shadow. Um, there is reflected light on it that contrasts that shadow because of the light that comes down and hits our surface and reflects up or could hit nearby objects and reflect up. So somewhere there's going to be like a light gray but not as white as your highlight. And then you're going to, that's going to be followed by um, the final thin sliver dark area where your object actually touches the surface. And then you have the, the cast shadow which can be um, very muted and soft and it's on the surface itself. It can be very sharp. Um, if you have a very bright light, you're actually going to have a contour line. You're actually going to be able to trace the edge of it. Sometimes you'll have multiple rings inside. And one of the ways to do that was to, to pull the color in an oval, way out to the edge, then go back, go halfway, and then go back again and darken half of that. And then always go back afterward and uh, redraw or redarken that edge to to maintain that on the object, that's the darkest part, okay? That's the furthest, furthest this object can get away from the light source, so that's going to be your darkest area, but that's going to look very natural afterward. So um, we used uh, continuous tone, we used a fine circular motion, we held our pencil back towards the back, we didn't overlap by drawing or shading in horizontally or vertically and then overlapping, nor did we use a pressure tone which created just one single burnished tone that was very shiny um, but prevented our eyes from seeing many different layers of light. Okay, so I hope this has been useful in just um, helping you learn how to do 3D shading.